Our next reader is author of Bodies in Motion, The Stars Change, and 10 other titles. Bodies in Motion was a finalist for the Asian American Book Awards, a USA Today notable book, and has been translated into six languages. The Stars Change is a science fiction novella and a finalist for the Lambda, Rainbow, and Bisexual Book Awards. Uh, she founded the Hugo-nominated magazine, Strange Horizons, and was guest of honor at WISCON 2010. She serves as executive director of the Speculative Literature Foundation, has taught at the Clarion SFF workshop, and is a clinical assistant professor of English at UIC. Please welcome Marianne Moenraj. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but Eden actually made me feel better about Trump, which I, you know, I didn't know that was possible, right? So, uh, a little perspective is a beautiful thing. You're welcome. So, um, okay. So I, I changed my mind about what I was reading while I was here. So I'm going to read part of the story um, and then a poem. And the story is in the same universe as the stars change, which I brought, and I'll just pass around for, I don't know, anyone who might want to take a look at it. Are you selling uh, books? No, I didn't. I just brought one copy. So um, I could sell that one, I guess. <laughs> so um, uh, The Stars Change is sort of South Asians in space. It's a novella. Um, and I was born in Sri Lanka. It is um, kind of about Black July, which was the these riots in Sri Lanka and ethnic conflict, um, but translated into space with aliens. So um, because I find it easier to write about post-colonial stuff um, at one remove, if that makes sense. So, uh, so I'm going to read you first part of a short story, which is in the same universe, um, and although it takes place, um, I don't know, like maybe 50 years earlier, I, I just, I'm still drafting it, so you're going to get part of it. Indenture. One, the offer. Tharani curled her toes in the hot sand, staring out at the line where water met the sky. Her chuckles lay abandoned nearby. These days, her feet hurt all the time, and shoes only made it worse. As long as she faced outwards, she could pretend that her life had not changed irrevocably, if she also ignored the messages from her own body, complaints which had grown increasingly angry over the last five months. Tharani couldn't ignore them, really, or the creature who stood a few feet away waiting for her response. Her mother would think it a demon, but the Irish nun who taught at her convent school said there were no such things as demons, really. Oh, the devil had its minions, but the demons of sickness and fire that her ancestors had made masks of had danced to ward away. The nuns denied them utterly. Sister Catherine had a quick hand with the ruler, especially when there was any chance of rooting out pagan ideas. Tharani, like the other Nagumbo girls, had quickly learned to keep family practices quiet. Krishna wouldn't mind if you gave him his ration of butter in secret. And as long as Ceylon lived under British rule, it was important to behave properly in your starched white uniform if you wanted to do well in your exams and make a good match afterwards. Tharani had never been good at proper behavior. She took a deep breath and turned, facing the tall being who looked more like angel than demon, Skin a little darker than her own brown, her mother constantly scolded her for spending too much time in the sun. White blonde hair that cascaded down its back and large golden eyes, the details beyond that were fuzzy. When she looked at the traveler, as it called itself, Tharney's eyes couldn't quite focus, and its speech was the same. She couldn't quite make out the words, but somehow the sense of them came through. Have you decided? Decisions. That was how she'd gotten into this mess. If she had turned left instead of right, leaving school that day, everything would have been different. Tharni, do you have enough to get some maspan? I'm so hungry. Raji practically danced in the street, her school shoes tapping the dirt. The shop they stood outside had an open window, and the scent drifted out, mixing pleasantly with the salty sea breeze. Spiced goat and onions that sizzled in the pan, wrapped in dough and baked until golden. You wouldn't be hungry if you didn't skip lunch, Tharani scolded her friend. But the moss pond smelled delicious of cinnamon and cardamom and cloves. 
She wondered if the cooks did anything special to make their food more seductive. Sister Catherine constantly scolded the girls about resisting the temptations of the flesh. The problem was, the temptations were so tempting. <laughs> but in this case, Tharani had good reason to resist. She was saving up her small store of funds to buy her own copy of Shakespeare. Appa had promised that if she did well on her exams, Tharani could go on to teacher's college rather than marrying right away. Amma didn't approve. She thought all this reading would give Tharani the wrong ideas, that she should spend her more time learning to cook a nice eggplant pario instead of filling her head with foolish desires. The boy that Amma kept threatening her with, if Tharani didn't behave more demurely, more in line with Amma's idea of proper behavior, wasn't even a boy. He was a 40-year-old widower, some cousin she'd never met who lived in the north, practically in the jungle, not for her. If Tharani held out long enough and held her tongue in front of her mother, they would sacrifice some other poor girl to him, and Tharani would have a chance for someone more palatable. As if the gods were answering her thoughts, a young man stepped out of the shop, a stuffed bag hanging from one arm. May I offer you lovely lady some maspan? It's still hot. Narayan, first son of the big house, the most tempting of all temptations. He smiled at her and held out a paper on which two buns were nestled side by side. Narayan's curling black hair fell across his eyes and Tharani reached out impulsively and brushed it away. It was the work of a moment done on pure instinct without thought beside her, Raji took in a quick, shocked breath. No, thank you, Raji said hastily. We have to get home before our mothers miss us. Tharani, come on, let's go. You go, Raji. I'll come later. Tharani said the words quietly, but firmly enough that after a frozen moment, Raji turned and walked away, her shoes kicking up dust on the dirt road, leaving Tharani and Narayan standing inches apart from each other. Tharani had been a good girl for so long, had made her heart into a box, and stuffed every wayward impulse into it. But now she had, unknowing, reached the limits of that heart-shaped box. How long had it been straining at the seams, ready to burst open? Tharani reached out and, deliberately, took one of the buns. When she bit into it, sauce dripped onto her chin. Tharani wiped it off with a finger and then licked the finger clean. Narayan's dark eyes fixed on her the whole time. That was how it started. The creature on the beach swayed towards her and Tharani felt a strange fascination. If she reached out and touched its skin, would it be soft or hard, wet or dry, like a field mouse trapped in the gaze of a snake, she could not look away from its glowing eyes. Will you come? Where would you take me? Far away. Far away was exactly what she wanted. The affair ended the way such things usually do, with the parents crowded into the girls' two small living rooms, shouting at each other, while two young people hunched miserably in their separate chairs, eyes downcast. Narayan did try, once, to offer for her. But Appa, if I married her, his father clutched his chest and said, have you forgotten your caste? Are you trying to kill me? And his mother hissed, remember your father's heart condition. <laughs> Narayan fell silent. Tharani hadn't said a word through the whole miserable exchange. She'd known, of course, that Narayan wouldn't be allowed to marry her. His prospects were too good. And she was smart enough to know that, as both her parents had informed her when she first told them what had happened. If only you had chosen, chosen a suitable boy. Her father spun to shout at her mother, Ronnie, I can't believe you're encouraging her. That's not what I meant, her mother protested. Tharani had hit her condition as long as possible, hoping a better solution would present itself. But she'd let out the waistbands of her skirts as much as she could. And there are only so many ways you can drape a sari without arousing suspicion. She was five months along when she broke the news. Her father hadn't laid a hand on her then, but when Narayan and his parents left and the door closed behind them, he swung around. He was a thin man and looked particularly pathetic in the British suit he'd borrowed for this occasion, but he was still strong enough to make Tharani's head spin when he cracked his hand across her face, sending her staggering backwards. Her mother squeaked, but didn't utter a word of protest. He turned his anger back on her next. See what you've raised? Who will marry her sisters now? Tharani's mother bowed her head and said nothing. Yeah. 
I'm going to stop there, actually, and read a poem. So, because um, then we get into other stuff. So, um, so that I don't know what that's going to be. Like it, it was originally a short story. Then I added a second section, and it's headed towards novella. It could be the start of a novel. It's all a little unclear to me. So. Um, We'll see. Ask me again at the end of the summer, hopefully. I will know by then. Um, and the other thing I'm going to read, uh, yesterday was my partner's in my 25th anniversary. Um, so, it's a little surreal. We were talking about it, and we were like, D it so does not feel like 25 years. I can't, I mean, we broke up for a year or so in the middle, but even so, it doesn't feel like anywhere near that long. Um, Anyway, this is a poem I actually wrote for him, I think of only about five years into the relationship. But it's apropos. The bones want to fly. When you are old, your skin will be delicate, fragile as tissue paper. My breath will rustle against it. My fingers will slip over the folds, under the creases, slide into the secret places. I'm always discovering new secrets within you. The bones beneath that skin will be light bird bones. They will want to go up, want to fly sunward. They will glow through the skin at night when we lie beneath the covers. It's too warm here, you will cry. I'm burning up. I will coax you to stay. I will lick sweat, sweat from your pale neck and blow on that shivering skin. I will lick my way down. I have done this so many, many times already. I will lick circles on your sunken chest. I will lick all the way down and take you entirely inside my mouth until you lose yourself, until you are no longer bound by earth and skin and bone. I have done this and will a thousand, thousand times. Afterwards, I fall asleep, my head resting on your stomach, one fragile arm flung over your thin thigh and hip. It is not much to hold you down. You will lie there in the dark, hand buried in my silvered hair, listening to the wind flying through the trees. Thank you. <laughs>